The nurturing instincts ingrained in their peculiar essence are needed to tend young people imbued with the natural inclination to deploy creativity and innovation in the disciplined pursuit to improve and change potential into a new value for all. Nurturing aside, women are natural incubators, not just of human seed, but also human ideas and concepts. There is absolutely nothing that you give a woman that she does not vastly improve on and present a more refined version of what has been given her. <laughs> Ideas, governance, and responsibilities are no different. This immediately draws the cohorts of youths and women from nice to have token appendages to the conversations about development in our national and nay continental context into the center stage. They become equally significant players as the dominantly male leaders who have had the reign of social, economic, and political destinies. Allow me at this point an analogy. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, men, youth, women. While each have their own strengths and signature operating arenas, imagine the powerful and efficient equilibrium that results when all three work together in tandem. When all three encourage and support each other, trusting enough to step down, step back, and allow the other rise and demonstrate their own capacity. Human existence, largely dominated by men, has achieved quite a lot, especially considering we have used less than a third of the capacity of our brains. Imagine what we could achieve in every aspect of life if we lifted the restrictions and limitations and operated at the full capacity of our brains. Women and youth are the remaining two thirds that we must fully utilize for us to get there. And I dare say that if governance gets it right in reaching this perfectly divine equilibrium, society can only be the better for it. This proposes that we reassess received positions and concepts to get results that beat the forces of a changed yet speedily accelerating world. Therefore, the imperative of rethinking is aptly the only guarantee for individuals, institutions, and society to be future-proofed against the concept of disruption. Disruption by its very definition, um, it is a failure that arises to people and cultures when they continue to do the same thing that has made them successful in the past. The past is what it is. It is past. As a traditional ruler, one must be ready to do away with the traditions that limit us. And one must embrace those that liberate us. We had said at our coronation that we are not here to refill a role, but to redefine and to recreate one. But before I move away from the past, let me once again present instances where significant progress was achieved when women were given a chance. As a monarch and a keen observer of history, as we say in worry, this one sweet pass. Could it be a coincidence that Britain experienced the golden age under Elizabeth I? or that it experienced the industrial and empire age under Queen Victoria, or that yet again it has experienced so much dynamism under Elizabeth II. In all three cases, instead of sabotaging the restrictions that were set by the status quo of male domination were dropped, and instead they supported and encouraged the monarch at the time and thus the results were unprecedented. More recently, the world is applaud applauding the huge strides of development that Germany has achieved 
under Chancellor Angela Merkel. Appropriate governance today must empathize with the social graffiti that is being written and streaming through the voices of youth and women in their cries to be heard and understood. Understanding our identity and the power of that identity will go a long way in charting this course. In Africa, no matter how much we try to look to the West or abroad in general, as the case may be, for inspiration as regards political, social, and economic development, the truth is, deep down, we are heavily inspired by our traditional institutions. And rightly so, they are key to our identity and our existence. Once these traditional institutions are able to go through their own internal evolution and the acceptance of opening up to the remaining two thirds, then it will be easier for all society to fully embrace it as a new reality. It's not unlike Moses growing up in Pharaoh's royal household or Colin Kaepernick growing up in his adopted household. These are beautiful external adornments that look and feel good. But until the full awakening and realignment comes from within, it will be superficial at best. Our traditional institutions are that within, and we must get it right in there so we can better reflect that energy out to the world. We ought to adopt the mindset that sees governance as a philosophical garden, characterized by creativity, innovation, and experimentation to transform entrepreneurial intention into success, which is the very cause that the Carrington Youth Fellowship Initiative is championing. Rethinking will deliver all the support. Mentorship, incubation, finance, the promotion that leverages the connection between creativity and innovation, with governance as the critical path to seeing that Africa and her people are integrated into the mainstream of global significance and reckoning. This is where a thriving, future-proofed and sustainable African society lies. The factory mindset that sees governance as a factory that churns out merely busy political activity will inevitably succumb to this garden mindset that we are talking about. We are praised that the actualization of this thinking is the true legacy and guarantee of the dearest desire of Ambassador Walter Charles Omowale Carrington. Time will not permit us to elaborate on the sentiment that earned the man who inspired all we are doing today the distinction of being conferred with that name, Omowale, translating to the son of our soil has come home. Today, Ambassador Carrington is a veritable ancestor in the African sense of those who sacrifice and offer their shoulders for future generations to stand on. Beyond his professional career, which he executed admirably well, Ambassador Carrington was a king of hearts, so much so the man has earned the distinction of being a veritable real estate in two regards. One etched in the hearts of Nigerians as a brother who helped save our national governance from the precipice during his tour of duty, and the other real estate on the very soil of Nigeria through the eminently deserved naming of Walter Carrington Crescent. This address hosts most of the embassies and chanceries in Lagos. Therefore, the conferment of this honor by a grateful Lagos state on behalf of an equally grateful country is commendable. Today, the inauguration of this symposium, today, by the inauguration of this symposium, the man and his purpose live on. In this regard, we commend the alumni of the initiative and charge you all to appraise the deep significance of the thinking that will emanate from your discussions today. Your fellowship as a platform frames those shoulders that we have mentioned. Therefore, this gathering is mainly about you. It is the solution designed to support you to lead thought and action in your divinely assigned continent of birth 
and its unique race. We give our blessings and prayer that you make the best of the opportunity as we commend the American Consulate and Dr. R.S.A. Carrington for the excellent work again. Thank you and happy deliberations. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.